before going any further with the specifics of the mechanism, let me just talk about the possibilities in terms of the simplest type of integral membrane proteins, and that is the ones that are referred to as single pass integral membrane proteins. So they can exist in a number of uh, flavors depending on their orientation. So if we just go ahead and call this lumen, which is, keep in mind, the same thing as the extracellular space in terms of the nature of the environments. And this would be the cytosol or the cytoplasm, really, of our cell. Then if we indicate those proteins, and we can go with green for the time being for those proteins, then the way to make single pass integral membrane proteins would be either by doing this, in which case you put the N terminus in the lumen and the C terminus in the cytosol, or you might do the absolute opposite. It would look exactly the same from a distance, but it would be the opposite orientation. Now the complication is that there, in fact, are two different ways of having a single pass protein that looks like this. And that's why you need that uh, designation that your book just does not seem to care for. And that is indicating this to distinguish it from something that is actually quite a bit different mechanistically for sure in terms of the synthesis. And that would be a protein that would look like this. Your book also doesn't like to protonate the N terminus, but I do. So um, there, we have all the possibilities of single pass integral membrane proteins in which this is the transmembrane domain. And that was once a topogenic sequence that you can be absolutely sure of. So once we have these things written, we can go ahead and identify them uh, so that we can keep track of them mechanistically as I continue. So this one we refer to as type one, the first one that we'll encounter, and this one is type two, and this one is type three. So because type ones use a mechanism that <clears throat> begins right with the, uh, where we ended off with the cleavage of the signal s sequence by signal peptidase um, and of the continuation of co-translational translocation. We'll cover it first, and then we'll talk about how that mechanism differs in the synthesis of the so-called type two and type three transmembrane proteins. Okay, so the first one off the bat will be the type one, and that process is shown in uh, this figure from your text 1242. So what's shown here is the entire sequence, maybe uh, not complete synthesis of the C terminus, but the sequence through the two important topogenic sequences that are required in order to make a type one integral membrane protein. The first being the standard issue uh, signal sequence. So I added some components to this translocon to make the point about that uh, soft bridge. So this is a ring of negatively charged residues that are on the cytosolic surface of sex 61 the translocon. And remember that the signal sequence has that positive charge at the very end terminus, and there's a hydrophobic stretch that comes here. And this will be the site where uh, signal um, peptidase does its job. So farther along up the nascent chain, there is another sequence that uh, is indicated in this color. This is gonna be, in this, the case of the synthesis of type one protein, this is going to be a stop transfer topogenic sequence, and you'll see why that has to, it has to be that way in just a minute. But for now, just imagine the process of co-translational translocation the way it was last time we talked about it. That is the formation by the ribosome, which is not shown here, but it's there. It's going to be doing all this. And in fact, so has the SRP, SRP receptor. They've done everything to get us to this point. They're just not shown on this diagram. 
But as a result of this positive charge encountering this negative charge during the first few uh, seconds of the resumption of translation at the translocon, you basically get a jam between those two things. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you're used to uh, film projectors, but if you uh, are, if you have a reel-to-reel -reel film projector and the front reel jams, then a loop will form in the film. That's exactly what's going on here. So it's not as though this loop is just being stuffed into the pore. In fact, the signal sequence goes in as a single sequence, but it gets trapped by that negative charge. And then the loop forms, and then you end up over here. So the other thing to keep in mind is this hinge and seam of the translocon. So the hinge is not actually visualized in the, a diagram like this, but it would kind of be that sort of thing that looked like this. And what's going on in the case of the uh, business of the translocon period is the sequential, reversible opening and closing of that seam. So, and keep in mind that what's on the other side of the translocon out here is phospholipid or lipid, period, single lipid cholesterol, whatever, uh, a very, very hydrophobic environment here. The pore is very, very hydrophilic. It's a water-lined amino acid residue full um, proteinaceous pore, so it's going to be aqueous. So what's happening is the signal sequence has been inserted into that pore. It starts out here, but the, the salt bridge causes that signal sequence to be inverted. But now what you have is a positive and negative charge salt bridge here, and then hydrophobic amino acid residues here. So when this seam opens up, those hydrophobic residues essentially dip their toes into the hydrophobic environment of the membrane and they like it. So that signal sequence migrates out. So this is not really accurate. That signal sequence should be out here somewhere for signal peptidase to recognize and clip here. And that generates, because this is the breaking of a peptide bond, that generates a new N-terminus right here and a new C-terminus just at the other end of the signal sequence. So, although we never do, if we wanted to, we could indicate that as C prime, and this would be NH2 or NH3 plus, if you're like me. So, the, uh, the overall process now has produced a modified N-terminus, and while that's happening, and what you can't see is that the ribosome is still doing its business of um, translation. But when this uh, stop transfer sequence gets into the translocon, now we have the positive charge on the C-terminal side of the nascent chain. So that would be right here. And keep in mind that the negative charges on the translocon are like a ring around here. So the salt bridge now does something different. It doesn't cause an inversion at this point. What it does is cause this entire sequence to get stuck in the interior of the pore of the translocon. And keep in mind that a, a stop transfer sequence is a hydrophobic region followed by a positive charge, not the other way around, the way the signal sequence is. So now you have the arrangement in which the hydrophobic residues of that topogenic sequence are in the pore but the seams are opening and closing continuously. So now this region dips it t its toes into the membrane, and that essentially is what has happened to get it out here. So what's not shown is we can imagine maybe the next ribosome um, doing the next co-translational translocation. Then you've got this green thing. You've got the processed end right here while the ribosome is still going. I don't really have the color to indicate the stop transfer sequence, but it would be right here. So now the overall process is for this seam to open up and this entire helix to move out into the uh, ER membrane. So if you went ahead and imagined that the ribosome is still here, then I hope you can see that it can continue to translate. And if it does, it would just be kind of pushed out into the cytoplasm, extending the now C-terminus uh, 
of the nascent chain. And it can be as long as you want it. But what you end up with is a protein that looks like this. Dang it. Like so. So process in terminus, a single transmembrane helix that was once a stop, uh, start, stop transfer sequence right here. I forgot to mention, which I just gone ahead and erased it, that your book calls this a start transfer sequence when it's a signal sequence. I really hate that. So let's just erase it. So anyway, back to my point, and that is that this sequence began on the nascent chain as a stop transfer sequence. Now it is a transmembrane helix. And you know, based on the topology of membranes, or if you remember, based on the topology of the stop transfer sequence, that there is a positive charge right here. And that's the positive charge that was on the topogenic sequence itself. So if you watch the coronavirus video, I mentioned that the spike protein of uh, COVID-19 and other coronaviruses is a type one uh, transmembrane protein. So at this, in this uh, version of it, what it would look like, single transmembrane region, the extracellular domain is extremely long and it's processed because there's a signal sequence on the spike protein. And that's, uh, that's a point I want to make about type 1 transmembrane uh, proteins, and that is that you can make the uh, extracellular domain, the luminal domain at this point, but it's going to be extracellular in the case of the spike protein. You can make it as big as you want because it doesn't put any constraints on the mechanism. The signal sequence is designed to get very large soluble proteins into the lumen, so it can certainly get a very large domain of an integral membrane protein into the lumen, and the lumen is going to be on the outside once vesicular trafficking is complete, and that's what we'll be talking about next. So uh, while we're here, I'll go ahead and tell you that the receptor for the S protein on lung cells, so-called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2, it is also a type 1, so it's got a, essentially the same kind of arrangement, a short cytoplasmic uh, C-terminus and a much larger N-terminal extracellular domain uh, that was produced by this uh, type 1 mechanism with the signal sequence.